Hey everyone, welcome to another BookTube channel. I'm Nick. Today, I'm going to be ranking every book written by author Paul Tremblay. If you found this video on the weekend of February 3rd, 2023, it's likely you did so because of the movie Knock at the Cabin, the latest M. Night Shyamalan joint. If you enjoyed the movie, you may be curious if the book that it was based on, Cabin at the End of the World, is worth checking out. I'm here to tell you right now, yes, it is worth checking out, as is pretty much everything else that's been written by author Paul Tremblay. I don't want to sound bratty here, but I kind of got in on the ground floor with Paul Tremblay. In 2015, I was working at Barnes & Noble as a bookseller, and once in a while, advanced reader copies, or arcs of books would be sent to the store by publishers. These arcs would be left on the break room table, and anybody could just claim one and bring it home and keep it. I walked in one day and saw a book titled A Head Full of Ghosts by this guy I've never heard of, Paul Tremblay. But the title was pretty interesting, I liked the cover, and it was free, so I brought it home. I read the entire thing, basically in one sitting, almost through the night, and as soon as I got back into work, I was like, I need to make sure that when this book comes out, I recommend it to everybody that comes in this store. And that's what I did. Once it was released a few months later, whenever anyone needed a recommendation, I would just hand them a head full of ghosts and say, this is the one. From that day forward, Paul Tremblay has become an auto-buy author for me. I've pre-ordered everything that he's released since then, and I don't do that with any other author. What I love about Tremblay is his boldness as a writer and his willingness to embrace ambiguity and non-standard prose. Almost all of his books use unreliable narrators, which is one of my favorite tropes when it's done well, and he is usually able to pull it off. His books are risky, and many of them pay off in really big ways. So, how do his books rank, and where should you start? Let's get into my completely subjective ranking of all of the Paul Tremblay books that I've read. Coming in at 7th at the bottom of my ranking is, unfortunately, his most recent book, The Paul Bearers Club. The Paul Bearers Club is written as a memoir of the main character, Art Barbara. Art was a social outcast in high school who starts a volunteer club, the Paul Bearers Club, of students who attend funerals and act as pallbearers for those who don't really have anyone else to mourn them. It's at this club that Art befriends Mercy, a slightly older and enigmatic girl who befriends Art, introduces him to new music, and is possibly some kind of emotional vampire. Whoa! The fake memoir follows Art throughout the years as his life doesn't go as he would have hoped, and at the center of it all is Mercy and her possibly supernatural influence. To make things more interesting, Mercy has gotten a hold of this manuscript and is writing her own notes in the margins so that she can tell her side of the story. I was hugely disappointed by The Paul Bearers Club, and honestly, it's the only of Tremblay's books that I would say that I genuinely disliked. Art is not a very compelling or sympathetic main character, nor is Mercy particularly charismatic as a foil. I just never found myself on the side of either of them, which ultimately made me not care about what was going on. There was also a huge issue with the tone of the Paul Bearers Club. Namely, what the tone was even supposed to be. This isn't a scary book by any stretch of the imagination, nor is it particularly funny or sweet, and it's not especially gripping as a drama. It also doesn't work as a good coming-of-age story because art is so thoroughly unlikable. I also mostly didn't understand what the stakes were in this book, where was the danger? What was the threat? It was all just a little too loosely defined, and by not committing to any one genre, it failed in them all. I also think the book fails to use its own gimmick of Mercy writing in the margins in any fun or meaningful way. At the end of each chapter, Mercy does provide a full written response to what preceded, but I wanted the marginalia to go full House of Leaves and take over the story at parts. It just felt non-committal as it is. Okay, enough negativity because I do really love Paul Tremblay's books and I want you to read them. So next up at number six, I am combining two books and those are The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland. 
Before Tremblay struck mainstream success with A Headful of Ghosts, he had written a couple of detective novels about Mark Genovich, A Private Eye with Narcolepsy. The reason that I'm combining these two books into one entry is the same reason I am not providing you with a more detailed plot description, and that's because I simply do not remember much about these books other than I like them. I read each of them back in 2015 and have yet to revisit them, although I do intend to at some point. Uh, I can rely only on my remembered impressions, which were that these books were Tremblay's early experiences with unreliable narrators, and they were generally fun. Not much more I can share here other than I am glad these books are back in print thanks to the success of his horror novels. Okay, we are entering now the top five, and all of these books I would say are at least very, very good, so basically any of these would be a great starting point with Tremblay. Just, you know, use your own discretion based on my descriptions. At number five, I have Disappearance at Devil's Rock. This is another book I've only read once because I don't actually own a physical copy of it. This is one of the only books that I've read as an ebook, and it's what helped me realize that ebooks really aren't for me. Disappearance at Devil's Rock is about a 13 year old boy named Tommy Sanderson who goes missing after hanging out with his friends at a state park. The book primarily follows Tommy's mom and the lead investigator of the case as they try to piece together the clues to locate him. This is a really solid book that, for me, had the unfortunate circumstance of being Tremblay's follow-up to A Head Full of Ghosts. For that reason, it's possible that Devil's Rock didn't strike a chord with me as much as it would have because it didn't meet those lofty standards. Nevertheless, the book is a gripping read and it solidified in me the belief that Tremblay was not a one-trick pony and that he was a bold new face in the horror genre. At number four is Tremblay's short story collection, Growing Things and Other Stories. Short story collections can be a great way to get to know an author, but they are also a bit of a risk. Not every story is going to work for everyone. However, Growing Things is one of the better collections that I've read, and I can honestly say that I enjoyed almost everything in there. What is great about these stories is that even though they are short, Tremblay finds a way to make them very distinctly Paul Tremblay stories. He still finds room for ambiguity and is still pushing the limits of narrative linear structure when possible. One of my favorite stories in here is called 19 Snapshots of Dennisport, which literally is a narrator going one by one through 19 pictures of a family vacation from when he was younger. However, with each passing snapshot, the true story is revealed and reaches a shocking conclusion. Another great story in here is Notes from the Dog Walkers, a story told, as the title implies, as a series of notes in email form left by the dog walkers of a high school teacher. The notes start off simply as the dog walkers letting the owner know how the dog was today and what they did on their walk. Once again, as the notes progress, a darker story reveals itself until you are left breathless by the final message. This collection is a really great appetizer and will give you a good idea whether or not Tremblay is the author for you. All right, top three now, and in that number three spot is the star of this weekend, Cabin at the End of the World. In Cabin at the End of the World, husbands Eric and Andrew and their adopted daughter Wen are vacationing at a secluded cabin in the woods a location where nothing bad has ever happened in the history of fiction. Despite the familiar setup, Cabin at the End of the World is not your predictable home invasion slasher in the woods story. The family has their solitude shattered by the arrival of four people wielding weapons who are insistent on being let into the cabin. The leader of the four, Leonard, informs the family that they have been tasked with the greatest and most difficult decision anyone has ever had to make sacrifice a member of their family or the world will end. Cabin at the End of the World is a phenomenal book that succeeds on its ability to keep the reader guessing. The invaders here are obviously insane with their talk of the coming apocalypse, except when what they're saying starts to actually come true. Or is it really coming true? Or are they just obfuscating the truth just barely enough to make it seem true? This push and pull of what the hell is really going on here makes every sentence of Cabin an important one 
and will lead to different interpretations from person to person. And, of course, there is the... event. It's not quite right to call it a twist, as it's more than just an unfolding of events, but whatever you want to call it, at the two-thirds mark of this book, something happens that is just... Wow! Talk about unflinching, surprising writing. The first time I read this book and I reached this part, I just froze up completely, mouth agape, like, Ugh. easily one of the most shocking scenes I've ever read. But most importantly, it's not disgusting. Like, yes, it's absolutely a gut-wrenching moment, but Tremblay isn't a sadist, and he doesn't get overly descriptive or deep into the gory details. He keeps things at an emotional level rather than a visceral level, and it's the right decision. I think a lot of people would put Cabin in their top two of Paul Tremblay books, but for me, the number two spot is held by Tremblay's 2020 book, Survivor Song. Written well before our own worldwide viral outbreak, Survivor Song is about people struggling to survive while a highly infectious strain of rabies ravages Massachusetts. Natalie, a pregnant woman, is bitten by an infected individual and calls her friend Ramola, a pediatrician, to help her reach a hospital and obtain a rabies vaccine before it's too late. I was absolutely riveted to my seat reading Survivor Song. The entire story unfolds basically as a single scene in real time over the course of a couple hours. As Natalie and Ramola make their way to safety, the dangers they encounter are frightening and all too real. Tremblay's depiction of the infected world is borderline prophetic, particularly in showing how the uninfected behave during the outbreak. It really is wild to think that he wrote this before March 2020. A quick note here about the ending of Survivor Song, without spoiling anything, I have no evidence to support this, but I believe that Tremblay would have preferred to leave the epilogue off the end of this book and just end it where it seemed like it was going to end. The epilogue is good, but I think the book overall would have packed a lot more of an emotional punch if we didn't get that closure. However, and again, total conjecture by me, I think his editors were like, listen Paul, we know you love an ambiguous ending, but we've got to put our foot down here. You can't leave us hanging like this. I was obsessed with the way that this book was written, and I can honestly say that of all of his books, this is the one that I finished the fastest. I absolutely could not put it down because I needed to know what was happening next. I am curious if I would feel the same after a reread since I know what happens now, but for now, this is my second favorite of his books. And now, number one, which you've probably guessed because I've mentioned it like a hundred times throughout this video, it's the book that started the whole slobbering love affair, A Head Full of Ghosts. I have recommended this book to so many people over the years, and I have yet to have a single one of them come back to me and not say that they loved it. Not just liked it, loved it. The story follows the Barrett family and the events surrounding their 14-year-old daughter, Marjorie. Marjorie has been exhibiting signs of severe mental illness and her father, a recently born-again Catholic, decides that the true cause of her personality change is demonic possession. As a way to help out with their financial strain, her father agrees to let the exorcism of Marjorie be filmed for a paranormal reality TV program. All of this information is recounted to us by Marjorie's little sister Mary, who is older now and remembering the events from when she was eight years old. A Head Full of Ghosts is the best example of an unreliable narrative that I have ever read. Not only is the story being told secondhand from Mary, but she's remembering the events years later as experienced by an eight-year-old. Who's to say how much she actually understood as a child or her, how well her memory has held up over the years? On top of that, we have the historical record of the reality TV show. But how real is that? Are the supernatural events that took place on the show actually occurring, or were they set up by the production crew? Where does the truth end and embellishment begin? We can never know. 
Tremblay dedicated this book to Shirley Jackson, and it's clear she was a big influence on the story. His main characters, Marjorie and Mary, are named after the characters from We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Jackson. A Head Full of Ghosts is exactly the type of book that Jackson would have written herself as it's heavily psychological, sometimes funny, and downright terrifying. This is, in my opinion, one of the greatest modern horror books ever written and will be remembered as a classic for all time. So there you have it, my completely definitive, correct, and unalterable ranking of Paul Tremblay's books. There's absolutely no chance that I would change my mind about any of these books' positions on this list, nor should your list differ in any way. However, if you insist on being wrong, let me know what your list looks like in the comments. Thank you for spending some time with me today, but now it's time to get back to reading.